you found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's Silver and Black Today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back, everybody, to the Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 AM in the city of Las Vegas. Summertime in the city. Yeah. You're not going to finish the lyrics for me? Come on, guys. <laughs> I don't know. Them. They don't know the lyrics. But anyway, we are here with you to talk about Raider football as we edge towards training camp. Rookies report on Tuesday. The uh, veterans on Friday, our own Chaz Osborne, will be there on Friday as well. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But welcome back to all of you here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Everyone else, too, listening on the radio.com app, wherever you may be. We have service members all over the world, all over the country, fans. Raider Nation is a wide group of folks. It goes everywhere, and they are listening on those. You can also stream us live on video, YouTube, Periscope, and on Facebook. We recommend YouTube for the best experience. Go there, subscribe, hit the notification button uh, as well so that you don't miss another video. Got a lot of stuff coming up here with training camp, including, as I mentioned, Chaz Osborne, who will be up in Napa this coming week. And then we will also be in Napa, Chaz, as I introduce you and welcome you to the show. We'll be in Napa on the 7th or 8th and 8th to yep. see the Rams workouts with them as well. How are you doing this morning? Yeah, it's great. We're going to get a lot of good stuff for all the listeners and all the viewers out there. It's going to be a good time. Although we are taking over under on how much work we'll get from you if you find the tasting room. Ah. No, not We're, as big of a wino as uh, my partner to the right over here. As as Kelly, speaking of Kelly, Kelly Kreiner, Kelly, man, thanks for joining us this morning. How you doing? I'm good. So you're saying you're not sophisticated? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. So so Kelly, that's what. So wine makes you sophisticated. It makes you smarter if you do it right. Yes, <laughs> if you do it right. Okay. Yeah. Well, being in Napa, of course, is going to be uh, a good time for everybody, right, guys? I mean, you think about. Uh, not only is it training camp, but then you're in one of the most beautiful parts of the country, if not the world. So uh, we are all three of us here to talk Raiders football with you today. Uh, and uh, I love my squad. I love my team, despite what some of you think of them at times. And we all think that. Of Do we know now. if that's the, the last um, training camp that will ever be in Napa? Or? Uh, you know, we have uh, on good authority that Reno continues to be the spot that we think they're going to end up. As we get more concrete information, we will report that. But yes, every indication that we have on silverandblacktoday.com, we've talked about this, we've talked about it on the radio as well, Chaz, good point, yep. that it appears to be Reno, which is great for Northern California fans, not that far away, right, guys, Yeah, for them to go over. Um, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. Now, what else do we have in today's show? Coming up after the break, Ryan Wilson from cbssports.com will join us. He's a national writer there, really love his work. He wrote a story, and he asked the question that I'll ask all of you in Raider Nation. Can John Gruden fix the Raiders? Okay, that's his question. That was his story about a week ago. We talked to him about that after the break. Then, after the half-hour break, one of my favorite guys on Twitter, uh, he's also the model for the backup quarterbacks in NFL, John Madden. I love that. So, <laughs> so funny. Um Benjamin Albright, he's an NFL analyst, now works with iHeartRadio in the Denver area. He will be with us as we start our tour, guys, of the AFC West training camps. Not only are the Raiders in camp, of course, but then also the, uh, the rest of the teams will be there, too. And we're going to talk to him about Denver and uh, what's happening with the Broncos, okay? Everybody's favorite team in Raider Nation. Then uh. next, uh, at, we'll close out the hour talking about a subject that we're going to be, I think, revisiting quite a bit here, gentlemen, and that is Hard Knocks. Jesse Reed from SportsNot.com joins us with Hard Knocks Storylines. He had a story about the 10 juiciest ones. We're going to talk about that and figure out with him which ones we're going to be most interested in watching, so we'll do that. Then in our second hour, Leo Gray, Super Bowl champion with the Raiders Back in the 1980s when they won in New Orleans, he's going to be with us to talk about going to camp as a rookie, to talk about training camp, coming in with the Raiders, but also 
uh, he's going to share stories with us. So we will have him around for for um, stories, but then he'll also tell us a little bit about camp and everything that's going on with that. So, guys, that's the that's what we're doing today. Looking forward you, to you it. Feel good. Yeah. I want to give a quick shout out to Matt Millen. Um, you know, last Christmas Eve, he had that successful heart transplant surgery. And then uh, he just announced this week that he'll be back in the broadcast booth for this upcoming season. So uh, great for Matt Millen. That was, uh, it was looking a little bleak for him. And he's fought it all the way back. And uh, now he's getting back to work. So four times Super Bowl champ, you know, yeah. two times with the Raiders. Great news now. Can you find Kelly a heart? Ah. <laughs> And I don't mean physically. Right, Kelly? Come on, Kelly. Let me have it, brother. Uh, okay. <laughs> no, okay. All right, we're just joking. I, was just, I just caught him off guard. No. Which is hard because Kelly's pretty, pretty quick. He didn't, he didn't He's silent. Dr. Pepper today. <laughs> <laughs> the Dr. Pepper. Um, but we, we are going to hit on a bunch of subjects today, and uh, it's interesting. But if you look at what's happening, guys, in the league, uh, as we get set for training camp, right, um, there, there's some interesting storylines happening. Of course, let's just spend a couple minutes. I don't want to spend too much time on it because it, it's pretty much a joke. And I, I, Kelly and I and, and you, Chaz, were texting about it. But um, Tyreek Hill. Yeah. Thoughts? Well, I was probably going to bring this up at the end of the show. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we will. So we'll talk about Tyreek yeah. Hill in Kelly's corner, uh, a, which is fine. Spoiler which is, alert. No, that, that maybe we should. No, no, it's called a tease. Yeah, maybe it's we should have talked about this like ten minutes. ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's called a tease. Yeah. So Kelly will be talking about Tyreek Hill in his Kelly's corner. See, that's just brilliant radio. Um, <laughs> But if you look at what's going on in the NFL, some of the storylines uh, that you're that you're following throughout the league, uh, we talked about the CBA last week. That that sort of kind of went by the wayside. The whole 18 game schedule. I hear a lot more now, guys, about this proposal of 17 game schedule with an extra buy with an international series. What do you guys think of that one? I I think the 18 game schedule is going to happen, or 17, or there's going to be one less preseason or two less preseason. And regu- and extra regular season games. I don't think it happens this CBA. I think it does happen on the next one. That's why they're floating all this out here now to prepare for four or five years down the line. Uh, I want to get rid of all the London and overseas games. It's and uh, that and Thursday night football. They're not good for the. They're not good for football. Right. The games suck. Nobody wants to be there. Yeah, but I Ke- mean, Kelly, the the international thing is only going to get bigger. I know, and I think it's I know bad you're saying it's sport. Sh- no, yeah. and, and I don't totally disagree with you there. I think that you're going to see an international series. You're going to see London. You're going to see Mexico City. And when I talked to Leo, who's coming in later, earlier in the week, he told me Asia's next. Yeah. They're going to have Japan, who already has a professional league. And China. And they're going to have China as well. So so it's only going to get bigger, which which I, I, I question, too, because, you know, what are you going to start doing? Are you going to start guys having – NFL teams eventually, maybe when we're really old, old guys, that that you're going to have different divisions that play in different time zones, different days of the week, and then you're going to have some real international championship. I, I just don't understand the long term. I would love to hear from the NFL a long term vision for where this international stuff is going. Yeah, the Mexico City thing's not that big of an issue to me because it's not that far. Same you know, what I mean, zone. you're not. Yeah, you're not making that big I agree. of a move. I agree. Same but, with Canada. But the whole pipe dream of trying to be in London. Yeah. You know, you get a kid that's a running back or a linebacker that grew up in Louisiana, and he gets drafted by the London NFL team. You're right. going to start pe- seeing people not sign, go back into the draft a year later, because between the travel, the taxes, and everything else, you know, you're making way less money. It's way more of a headache. And you know, hey, I've been to London. It's an amazing city. Yep. If I'm a 22 year old kid. And you're telling me I can live in Dallas, New York, somewhere else, or London. I'm staying here just for the travel, the wear and tear, and everything else because your career Taxes. will be a lot better. Taxes, because I, I, no one's explained to me where, if, for example, when they play the game in London, that's a game check. So players, Chaz, as you know from your NBA experience, do players get their paychecks and pay taxes in the area where the game was played. So if you play, if you're a Raider and you play in Kansas City, you pay tax in Missouri and in California. Right. Do they do that games. overseas too? Well, that's what I'm wondering. Oh, that, I, we'll have to get somebody on yeah. about that. Because to me, that's an interesting point too. Because now do you have to pay 
the VAT tax, all that stuff you pay in Europe, Mm -hmm. plus your home tax in the United States. So you're paying three taxes. The guy that actually started that, like, baseball, or well, it started out sports tax thing, lives here. He lives here in Las Vegas. Okay, so Kelly's got homework now. He's going to go get that guy on the show. Perfect. <laughs> he was one, he was one of my regulars at one of the bars I used. Oh, was he? Okay, yep. there you go. See, so, yeah, that works out perfect. I love it. One of the first person to send in a check, Art Shell. Really, Art Shell was the first check they got from that. Wow. Huh. So there you go. See, it's uh, it's great when a plan comes, comes together. Full circle readers. <laughs> <laughs> so what if they move the um, the Thursday night to Friday or Saturday night? Would that make it a little bit? No, that makes it even worse. It makes it worse. Yeah, because then you're because Thursday night you own the night. Friday and Saturday people go out and do everything. Like right. That. I'm just saying that play Sunday, play Monday. That's it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, but you're also forgetting, too, that with Friday, Saturday, you have high school, which is big. And I mean, especially oh, yeah. in other communities, uh, it's huge. And yeah, then you have college football. Nobody, nobody cares about Texas. That's, oh. that's high, no, school fo- other, high school football is religion down there. I get that. Well, no, it is in, in the South, too, all the way through the South. <sighs> yeah. as, SEC country, same thing. Not as much as you think. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Kelly. Kelly is our geography, football geography specialist. So I love that. But yes, but Wait, I think. Where are you guys from? California? Yeah. Well, I'm from the Midwest, basically the South. I'm from the Midwest. I, I, I was born in Illinois. I never knew how Chicago was oh, considered right. the Midwest. I lived in Kansas City twice. That's the Midwest. I lived in Carbondale, Illinois. You don't get much more Midwest than that. <laughs> You're an hour and a half from Paducah, Kentucky. Anyway. <laughs> We're going to step aside. We're having fun. Um, When we come back, we're going to be joined by Ryan Wilson, CBSSports.com. Can Gruden fix the Raiders? You're listening to Silver and Black Today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of the Silver and Black. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas. We're going out now on the attorney Michael Troiano newsmaker line, and we bring in CBSSports.com NFL writer Ryan Wilson. Ryan, thanks for joining us here in Las Vegas this morning. Absolutely, Scott. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate it. All right. So as the season gets geared up, one of the questions, and I I saw your story, you wrote a story uh, back a week and a half ago or so, Talking about John Gruden and a burning question. You were going through burning questions. Of course, there are many of them as we head into the NFL season. But the question was, can John Gruden manage the strong personalities, manage this remade roster, and fix the Raiders? First, let me ask you this. When you look at the Raiders, the changes they made in the offseason, talk about – we'll get to a second into Gruden coming back to coaching after being gone for nine years – but when you look at that roster with an Antonio Brown, with a Richie Incognito, uh, with a Vontes Burfecht, what kind of extra challenge has now been added for Gruden um, to really manage as he coaches this team into 2019? That's one of the biggest questions, and I think that is right up there, and we can talk about it in a little bit, and 1B might be the schedule that the NFL has sort of screwed the Raiders with, but that's out of John Gruden's control. What is within his control is how he handles his roster. And it starts with Antonio Brown, who it's very clear and quite obvious that he wanted his way out of Pittsburgh and he got his way out of the Pittsburgh. It wasn't entirely his fault, and, and I would never pin that on him. Roethlisberger actually took some of the blame after the dust had settled. He seemed surprised by it, but there are reports that Roethlisberger isn't the easiest person to play along with. And, you know, he's been there the longest, and on some level you get that, but you never hear Tom Brady, former receiver, talking that way about, about the Patriots quarterback. That said, Antonio Brown is interested in one thing, and that's Antonio Brown. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I, I, that's the, probably one of the best compliments you could give him. He works harder than anyone in the league. He just turned 31. But if you go back and watch him, and I watched every Steelers game throughout his career, he loves having the ball thrown to him more than any other player I've ever seen in the NFL. And if he's not getting seven, eight, nine targets a game, he pouts. And that's the reality of it. When the ball is in his hand, he is a hands. He's a game changer. But you wonder sometimes: is he more interested in the personal stats or more interested in the wins? And you come away thinking that he's more interested in the stats. Now, listen. Again, that is not a bad thing, and especially uh, on a Raiders offense that's trying to trying to refine itself after a couple down years. You want someone like that who comes in and sets the tone, gives people. Um, 
gives the other players uh, a target in terms of how to achieve what they need to do. And I think that's incredibly important. But again, you have to be able to balance that. And I don't know if Gruden is going to be able to do that if the Raiders start slow. And that's a that's a big problem. If that team starts slow, there are huge concerns about holding it all together. And I think A.B. is less a concern than someone like Vontez Perfect, who is, by all accounts, plays hard, but he has a knack uh, of sort of rubbing people the wrong way. Oh, yeah. And it starts with the coaching staff. So these are all things they have to sort out. And um, if it works, great. If not, that's going to be a huge problem. Yeah, and Ryan, I've said that all along here on the show, that um, you know, it's great when you go into a season, everything's happy and, 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 and rosy, but then when you face adversity, and if you covered the NFL now for a long time, you see that where everybody gets along just fine, but when things go tough, things go wrong, uh, it can it can unravel very quickly, and so we'll see with that schedule. I agree with you. I think the Raiders schedule uh, them and the Buccaneers. I really got the short end of the stick when it comes to scheduling this year. Now, when we look at Gruden, and you see him coming back after nine years, uh, there's no question when you look at the success that John Gruden had, even in Tampa Bay, where he didn't, as you point out, have a franchise quarterback. It, it didn't get uh, it was it was a little ugly there at the end for him uh, when he was let go. But the Raiders, too, at the same time, have just been the the poster child of futility in the last 17 years, sans one year since the 2002 Super Bowl. Really, you're talking about uh, 2016, where they went 12 and four. And that was really uh, an amazing job, too, by Jack Del Rio. One of the best guys in the NFL. Uh, it didn't work out in Oakland at the end of the day for him, but uh, there's nobody I think that shows class and dignity more than Jack Del Rio after he's been gone from the Raiders. But when you look at this, and I, you you tweeted or you put a you embedded a tweet in your story from NFL Research about these coaches who've come back: Pete Carroll, Chan Gailey, Art Shell, Joe Gibbs, Dick Vermeil. And how it's not that easy. Now, when you look at Gruden's situation, let's look at the positive side first, and then we'll talk about some of the challenges. When you look at his situation coming back from that nine years uh, uh, layoff and, and doing television, what advantages or what makes you think that he can turn it around? Well, I, I'll give you this. He was invested in football from the time he was fired until the time he was rehired, whether he was uh, doing the fired football coaches clinic, whatever, whatever his sort of sidekick was, mm-hmm. where he was in depth working with quarterbacks. And we saw that in ESPN. We also obviously know about his money in that football stints. And um, he was in it. And, and I appreciate that. Sometimes coaches step away. Bill Cowher stepped away. You get the sense that he is not watching film eight or nine hours a day. You don't <laughs> get that sense with John Gruden. Right. And, and I think that's important. But John Gruden's also incredibly stubborn. That has served him well in the past. But I do wonder, and we saw, we sort of saw hints of this. I don't know how much of this is tongue in cheek and how much of this is serious. But he sort of, um, he wasn't crazy about the analytics conversations last year, and, and I get some of that. But but that's not something you want to shun. And I think they've since hired analytics guys. But you just have to be careful because when you're coming off a, a nine year layoff, everything has to go exactly right for this to work out. And, and they're. And this happens with every coach. This isn't just coaches that take layoffs. Coaches make mistakes every year. Front offices make mistakes. We know that he and um, Reggie McKenzie weren't exactly on the same page with the player personnel decisions. Uh, I know that I, I'm pretty sure that Reggie McKenzie didn't want Mar- Mar- uh, Martavis Bryant for a third round pick. <laughs> but we, we we know that John Gruden loved his potential. And you watch Martavis Bryant highlights, and you love his potential. You watch the body of his work, and, and maybe he's not worth a third rounder. So um, I think Derek Carr is a good starting point. I think it's uh, important that Gruden didn't give up on Carr when it looked like he would at part uh, during parts of last season. Mm-hmm. I think Carr can be a really good quarterback. I know he's extremely divisive. I know fans are, are split on him. But 2016 season was lights out. Everything else has to be right around him. And I think it's important that, that Gruden make that happen. And, and the moves he's made this offseason, the moves that Mike Mayock made this offseason – that's what they're trying to accomplish. I think the big issue we just talked about is, is the sort of the locker room headaches. How will that detract from what they're trying to accomplish, especially if things get off to a slow start? Yeah, it'll be interesting. And I think the Derek Carr thing, it, it's, it's interesting because you, you go to other NFL cities where they've had issues with finding a starting quarterback. Many of them would, would kill to have Derek Carr. But in, in Raider Nation, it seems as though fans definitely split on him, as is a lot of the media. When you see the coverage, uh, not everybody's convinced that he can be the, the quarterback that they need him to be. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see what happens over time. And I, I'll add it to when I was looking at those names, Pete Carroll, obviously, he's the, as you say in your, stand, in your story, the gold standard because he came back after 11 years out, although he was in the college game. 
and he's been 79 and 48. John Gruden, out of all those guys, three years younger than the youngest uh, previous to him, which was Pete Carroll. So even though age, you know, between the difference between 55 and 58, not that great, but it should be interesting to see. Now, if we look at the challenges here for John Gruden, when I talked to Michael Lombardi last year when uh, Gruden was hired, uh, Michael said, hey, listen, you know, he, he can be, you know, John knows player personnel. He knows all this stuff. But can he be patient enough to install his system, install his philosophy and carry it out, i.e. like Bill Belichick does in in uh, New England? Um, and I think you mentioned that earlier with patience. Do you think that's going to be the take tough? Because even though Al Davis fired him and they had their rift and all that stuff, in many ways, John Gruden is a little bit like Al Davis. He falls in love with talent and he wants to go get it. Yeah, no, that's a great point. The good news is that Mark Davis isn't going to fire him anytime soon. <laughs> um, they're headed to Vegas. They need John Gruden to be the face of that franchise, much more so than any other player on this team. And, and I feel like it, it, that, that thing, the patience has to be the thing. And, and it's sort of funny. We saw a different John Gruden in the Monday Night Football booth, one that was certainly more media-friendly and um, less intense. That flip uh, switch flipped last year when he was on the sidelines, and, and I get that, and I get the edge that you have to have as a, as a coach, but you do have to be patient. And, and I mentioned the patience with Derek Carr, which I, I think obviously Carr appreciated, but I, but I think it serves his team the best in, in terms of their long-term interest. They didn't go after go out and draft a quarterback or one of the three first-round picks. I'm fine with that. There's no reason to, to rush Carr off the field when you have him on a relati- uh, relatively cheap contract, and you can fill all the other needs they had. I was fine with the Cleveland Farrell pick at number four, if he turns out to be a top 10 pass rusher, no one cares when he was drafted. So I, we don't know whether he's going to be uh, a Josh Allen in terms of pass rush or whether he's going to be his own Cleveland Farrell. And I'm, I'm fine with that. And may I point to the leadership qualities being a big part of that. Um, I wasn't crazy about the Abram pick, but just more because he's a box safety than a deep guy. But they right. need guys on defense, so that's fine. And, and Josh Jacobs, as a first-round running back, I have no issue with that. He helps – Derek Carr in that offense immeasurably. He helps the offensive line immeasurably. So these are all pieces that make sense. And and I I think you're exactly right, Scott. You have to be patient if you're Gruden. We'll see if you can do that. Because that schedule is unbelievably brutal. They travel more miles than any other NFL team. They travel more miles than three NFL teams combined. (laughs) So they have a lot of you know, travel miles ahead of them. We know that John Gruden isn't crazy about being in airplanes. So he has to overcome that obstacle if that's what he considers it. And they still have to find a way to win football games. We know it's incredibly tough for West Coast teams to travel east and, and win what feel like 10 a.m. kickoffs. So there are a lot of things stacked against the Raiders. And, and um, you know, the personnel has to be right. And John Gruden has to be right more times than not. And more times than, than his colleagues when he's traveling, you know, thousands of miles to play football games. It'll be interesting, uh, Ryan, and and I think that we'll learn a lot because – uh, yeah, you might not have the roster for them where they want it to be. They've made, I think, improvements there, but managing that locker room, managing adversity, uh, because this year, you know, here in Vegas at the Sportsbook, they have them at about six and a half with the over-under on wins. If I was a betting guy, I would take the under at this point because of that schedule, but I think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword or a risk-reward thing, whereas if they can come out and do better than people anticipated despite that brutal schedule – that could propel them into, I think, a pretty good situation as they move here to Las Vegas next year. But great, interesting story. Ryan Wilson, file, follow him on Twitter, at Ryan Wilson, of course, CBSSports.com. Ryan, we appreciate your work. We hope to have you on later in the season. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. All right, we're going to step aside. We'll be back here on Silver and Black today on CBS Sports Radio 1140. CBS Sports Radio. This is Mark Bedane, president of the Raiders. You're listening to Silver and Black today. All right, indeed you are. Welcome back to Sunday without football, but not for very much longer. That's right. We are inching up on the season. Camps have begun. And one of the first camps that uh, that started thanks to the NFL season and the Hall of Fame game was, of course, the Broncos, and we want to start uh, giving you guys a view into the AFC West training camps, and we figured why not start with the team that Raiders fans just love so much, right? Hey. If you're a Raider fan out there. But it, really interesting stories, I think, with the Denver Broncos. And now joining us 
live from Denver is our good friend Benjamin Allwright, NFL, NFL analyst, also now an iHeartRadio host in Denver. Congrats on the new gig, man. Oh, yeah, guys. Appreciate it. Uh, you know, whole new sled of work. <laughs> That's right. You're you're used to working hard, though, man, former military guy. You, you, you're you not going to have any problem with radio. I know that. All right, so let's jump in, uh, Benjamin, with the with the with the Broncos here and what's going on in 2019. Of course, Vic Fangio now in as head coach comes over from the Bears. Talk to me first about that. What's the mood? What's the culture like now with Fangio in charge? Well, I think the previous regime was a bit more trying to be buddy buddy with the players. Um, you know, Vic's looking at trying to make sure we've got solid football going on here. I would suggest that the overall makeup of the Denver Broncos is probably going to be pretty similar. Uh, they're definitely going to be a defense first football team. Um, the defensive philosophy has changed, uh, with, with Wade Phillips and, and then Vance Joseph and Joe Woods. Of course, you had uh, a lot of man cover one, cover zero kind of, kind of defense going on now. It's going to be, uh, an umbrella zone cover two um you're going to see you know a lot more ball hawking out of the safeties than than you were in man coverage which kind of benefits the safeties they have here i think justin simmons is going to be a breakout player in this defense um but through through three days of camp so far it's been all defense uh the offense has looked uh miserable so far so uh, we're interested to see if they can pick it up well and and again we're talking to benjamin albright from uh from denver from the broncos camp he's out there uh working as a now as a radio host NFL analyst, of course, everyone's familiar. One of the best follows on Twitter, by the way. Uh, let's talk to offense, and, and, and Kelly and Chaz will jump in on this too, but Joe Flacco, of course, replaces Case Keenum. Um, and so the Broncos now, their third coach and fifth quarterback since Peyton Manning retired. Here's the question. The question becomes, does, does Flacco have enough left in the tank to lead this team to where they need to be. Of course, the Broncos had back-to-back losing seasons for the first time since 1972. What's your view there, and will that O-line be able to protect him? Has it improved enough that uh, it'll give Joe T- Flacco the time he needs? Well, that that is the question. Um, you know, they've invested a lot of money and draft picks into this offensive line, and I'm going to be honest with you, through practice two, three days, it hadn't looked like uh, that investment has paid off. The right side of the line has been horrendous in allowing pressure through, and, um, you know, that's the side that has Ron Leary and, and Juwan James on it, where you've got your money invested. So, um, you know, it's it's going to be a problem. They're hoping to get that fixed. Uh, a lot of that is, you know, the new offense, new offensive coordinator, Rich Gangarello, and new quarterbacks trying to get timing down with different things, but uh, that offensive line, that, that's got to be a, a, a glaring red flag, especially because there's no depth, really, this year. Um, Billy Turner's gone, so, you know, outside of Elijah Wilkinson, they don't have anybody that's really um, NFL-caliber spot starter, if need be, kind of guy. And, uh, you know, it, it, it could get really bad if one of those guys go down. Um, you know, they brought in Mike Munchak, the Hall of Fame line coach. They're kind of hoping that he can coach some of these guys up, but... Like I said, early on, it hadn't looked all that great. Uh, as far as Flacco goes, he's going to be the quarterback here until he can't be. Uh, he and Drew Locke are head and shoulders above everybody else here. Uh, Kevin Hogan, I don't I don't even know why he's getting reps at this point. Um, and then Brett Ripton looks like one of these guys they're going to stash on the practice squad. So, uh, you know, we'll see we'll see how all that shakes out. But, you know, Flacco, uh, he, he can do more than Case Keenum. I'm not sure in the end there's going to be more production necessarily, but he's able to do more. Hey, but- Hey, Benjamin, it's Kelly here. Uh, we saw that the Broncos drafted Noah Fant this year in the draft. Um, is that more of them looking to diversify their tight end group, or is the Jake Butt injury from last year, is he not coming back? Because he would have been a first-round pick last year if he doesn't get hurt in the bowl game. Well, you know, but he's coming back off the injury. You're right. That's part of it, Tom. I think part of it is they, you know, they love to run two tight end sets in this offense. Uh, it's wide zone. Um, and they, they love to have that. And if you've got two tight ends, you want to make sure one of them's a mismatch guy. Uh, so you're able to run deep crossers. Broncos don't have a lot of explosion on the offense outside of Emmanuel Sanders, who's coming back from injury. Most of these guys are, you know, are not explosive. Portland Sun's a big guy. Uh, he's great with the back shoulder fade and jump ball, but he's not really what you call explosive. Same thing with Tim Patrick. It was kind of a clone of, of Cortland. And then you look at, you know, Deshaun Hamilton. Uh, you know, his game kind of reminds you of Jabbar Gaffney a little bit. A guy who's really good at finding the soft spot in zone, but, you know, you're not really rolling coverage over the top of him. So they're trying to find guys with some, with some deep speed. And, you know, Fant's one of those guys they brought in. He creates a mismatch, and he can be that second tight end. You talk about the Sanders injury. You think Cortland um, Sutton is ready to step up? 
I, it's not that he won't step up. I mean, he's just a, he's a wide receiver too. I mean, that's what he is. Um, you know, he's great if you're, you know, in the red zone. He's great with that big body to, you know, to kind of box you out. But he's not a complete receiver right now. He's a, he's a basketball player playing wide receiver. He's still learning the game. And uh, he doesn't have that third gear, that elite deep speed that, you know, a guy like Emmanuel Sanders or, um, you know, some of these wide receiver ones have. Right. I feel like the Broncos kind of have the same situation as the Raiders, whereas there's a lot of young, you know, versatile players, maybe like Kareem Jackson and, and Justin Hollins. You know, they're trying to figure out where everybody fits. Do you see this as a season of kind of a rebuild, or do you think the Flacco addition and that defense is enough to get them to the playoffs? You know, I don't know. I, from what I've seen out of this team so far, they're going to struggle on offense, um, and I, I think that's going to be a problem. Uh, if the offense clicks, and again, we're day three. We've only had one practice even in pads, so uh, it's a little premature. But if the offense gets going and gets rolling, this team could be a 500, uh, maybe a little bit better team. Um you know, I, I think you know, seven and nine, nine and seven is probably the window here. Uh, if they get a couple lucky breaks, they might get to ten. And you know, if injuries decimate them, they, they could obviously be worse. So, in your opinion, if the if the offense is stagnant for this long, how long will it be till Locke gets in there? Uh, say that again. I'm sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. If, if the offense isn't looking so good, maybe halfway through the season, when when do you think they bring in Drew Locke and just turn it over to him? Well, I think they've got Flacco to kind of be the guy. Right. Um, you, you know, I think that. They don't, there's no guaranteed money owed to Flacco, so they're going to give him every chance and kind of let him be the guy. And if he's good, well, then that creates a tradable asset that doesn't cost him anything next year. If he's bad, they can cut him. It doesn't cost him anything next year. Uh, that gives him the opportunity to develop Drew Locke. I, I think Drew's looked pretty good. He's had some moments where he looks like a rookie, but he's had some wild moments as well. I mean, he's had to, had to throw a camp um, just a couple of days ago. He threw a 50-yard bomb to Brandon Langley, who you know, went up and got a one-handed. Um, I, you know, I, th- I think Drew is probably going to be, end up being a star in this league, uh, but they're slow playing him right now, and the coach is doing the motivation through the media thing, and you know, we'll see how that shakes out, but I think Drew Locke's going to be the guy next year. Yeah, I feel like there's always like one player that comes out of, you know, off the radar, just out of nowhere um, in training camp, and then just bursts onto the scene. You know, that was Philip Lindsay for the Broncos last year. You see, um, you see him progressing, or is he, is he going to flatten out? His defense has kind of got to look at him now, or is he going to well, I think you know. I mean, I think that he's going to be fine. Uh, he's hyper productive. He was hyper productive in college. Um, I, I thought he was a glaring omission from the combine. Um, Lindsey's come back off the wrist injury. He's he's looking fine. I think uh, you know they want to get Royce Freeman maybe a little bit more involved in goal line and short yardage, uh, but but. You know, otherwise, I think Phil's going to be fine. I think from a, a yardage production standpoint, uh, Phil will maintain, uh, if not get better, by having you know weapons around him. I, I think that in terms of touchdowns, I think Royce might come in there and vulture some of those touchdowns away. But uh, you know, if you're a fantasy football player and all that, but overall, you know, I think that uh, this offense is really going to be predicated off wide zone running with Phil Flinzy and then boot action with uh, boot action with Joe Flacco trying to hit Noah Fant and Emmanuel Sanders on the deep cross. All right, we're talking to Benjamin Albright from the Denver Broncos training camp. Of course, uh, Benjamin, NFL analyst and uh, now host on iHeartRadio up in Denver. One last question for you. Was the money – so you, we, we talked about the additions and, and, and subtractions with Denver. Of course, defense uh, – the defense was much better, had trouble on third downs and with the run giving up almost 120 yards per game. Um, and then you add some of those additions. So Jawan Jones, they guarantee him $32 million. How has he looked so far? How is, I'm sorry, you keep getting that. Who was oh, the sure. Last, who was the name you J- Juwan Jones? James, excuse me? I said James. <laughs> I, I cannot, I'm sorry. I you having trouble? Hear you. Your microphones. Still. Yeah, your microphones. I can't quite understand the name you're saying. Juwan? Uh, James. Oh, Jones. Joe Jones? Jones. It, Jones has looked all right. James. Jones. Yeah, uh, sorry, he's man. He's an uh, inside linebacker in place of uh, Todd Davis, if you're talking about the inside linebacker, Joe Jones. Yes. Uh, he and Alexander Johnson have rotated a little bit at inside. They've... Uh, you know, they've looked fairly good. I think they like Justin Hollins back there more than the nickel set, though. A 6'5 linebacker who's mostly played the edge, but he's got some athleticism. Creates, uh, creates a little trouble with that, that deep post throw in the cover, too, because of his height. So, um, you know, I think ultimately that's the direction they'll go. Great. All right. Benjamin Albright, thanks, man. We appreciate it. We'll get you on during the season, I'm sure. Absolutely, guys. Take care. All thanks right. Up. Benjamin Albright from iHeartRadio and also NFL analyst. Follow him on Twitter at Benjamin Albright. Great stuff. Uh, we're going to step aside. When we come back, we're going to be joined by Jesse Reed from Sports Knot. Hard Knock Storylines. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. 
only way to take silver and black today with you is with the Radio.com app. Download it today and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. In, in my view, top five city in the entire world, Las Vegas, Nevada. Thanks for joining us, folks. We're going, wait, you guys hear that? It's a knock. You hear that knock? It's hard knocks. Oh. Right? Dad, uh, the dad wow. jokes never stop. <laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, yes, my five children would agree with you. Uh, okay, although now with an older with older children, with my daughter being twenty two and she's out, she's you know full adult, providing for herself, everything. I can get a little more risky with the jokes. I could I can tell her some more uh, adult dad jokes. Correct, not quite Richard Pryor, but <laughs> but uh, but but we're getting there. All right. We are now going to talk about Hard Knocks, and joining us on the uh, attorney Michael Triano newsmaker line is Jesse Reed. He's an editor and writer over at SportsKnot.com. Jesse, thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on, guys. All right, now, so you wrote a piece back a few days ago on the 10 juiciest, and I love that word, that, that, that and the word moist are not used in headlines no. very often, <laughs> but... but <laughs> But when they happen, they kind of catch your, your eyes. And, and you guys, you know, that leads to clicks. That's a good thing. So when we look at uh, Hard Knocks and the Raiders, I mean, is there a team better for Hard Knocks, built better, the history and what's happening with them now than the Raiders? I think not. I, uh, I think it's just made for television. I, as soon as it was announced, everybody in the NFL, around the NFL, was rejoicing, and especially teams that were not picked. <laughs> Uh, there's just so much drama and, you know, especially with the move to Vegas coming up, there's just so much, it's going to be palpable, uh, the tension, I think, within training camp and so many expectations, so many personalities. Yeah. It's made for TV. It is. And Jesse, we, I, I wish we could go through all 10, but we want, we wanted to I think focus on a few of them with you. Then you wrote about them. Number one was, uh, and this is the second on your list, uh, was Will Vontaze Perfect and Richie Incognito behave? Now, to me, that's like two questions because with Perfect, it's on the field stuff, right? With Incognito, there's been on the field stuff in the past, and of course, most recently, it was off the field. Talk about that storyline and, and, and how you think that's going to unfold. Well, the Perfect angle is very interesting because... He is an on-field problem, um, has been for years. He probably will behave in training camp, but then there's Antonio Brown on the other side. And, of course, those two guys have a huge history uh, from their AFC North battles. And perfect, you know, seemingly trains to knock the guy out of the league multiple times. Um, you know, Antonio Brown said when he knew they were going to be on the same team that that was a, a washed-up storyline. It's just trying to create drama. You guys need to get over it. And that may be true, but what's going to happen in the heat of training camp, uh, you know, when the competition runs hot and the temperature outside gets hot and these guys are starting to go at it, you know, uh, Berthick doesn't seem to have an off switch. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see if they end up clashing at all. Um, as far as incognito goes, I, I'm all for second chances. I'm all for guys that have ability, having opportunity to play, but he seems to have um, some issues going on upstairs that I don't know if he's gotten help with. Uh, he's had some significant off-field issues uh, involving police and threats and a whole bunch of stuff that's no good. And um, it'll be interesting to see if he's a level-headed guy you know, during training camp or if he's going to explode and, you know, cause trouble. I don't know. Um, just some really uh, live wire type personalities that have caused trouble in the past and now they're on the same team. And who knows, maybe they'll go head to head linebacker and guard. <laughs> That's gonna be- All right. We're talking to Jesse Reed from sports thought about uh, storylines, plot lines for the hard knocks the Raiders will appear on here in a few days. Hey, Jesse, it's Chaz here. <clears throat> I feel like there's so many great stories on the field that I don't think the off-the-field stories will be a distraction. I mean, the biggest discussion we've been having is kind of the battle for left guard, you know, between Denzel Good and Richie Incognito, and they just brought in Jonathan Cooper. Who knows if he'll, if he'll bring it back. But, you know, the, the development of uh, tight ends, Darren Waller and, 
and Foster Moreau. And, and you know, will any of these cornerbacks push Gary Ann Conley or, or Darrell Worley for the, for the starting spot? You know, there's, just, there's so many on-the-field things. I'm, I'm hoping that the off-the-field stories won't be a distraction. Um, but the one question, I guess, um, is on everybody's mind is the Derek Carr. Is this, is this a make-or-break season for Derek Carr, or what are your thoughts? I think it is, and mainly because Gruden and Mayock were both outspoken about being interested in the top quarterbacks this year. Right. They didn't even try to hide it. Uh, Derek Carr even had talked about it. He, I think it was on social media. He kind of responded to that. Um, obviously, he's not a big fan of them looking into other quarterbacks. And um, I think this year they have the weapons. You know, they have obviously Antonio Brown, one of the best receivers, not only in the game today, but in a long time. Um, if you've seen him working out, he's definitely focused on football right now, and that's a good thing because he's so darn good. They have the deep threat uh, with Tyrell Williams. They have the running back with Josh Jacobs, and I do think that the offensive line's improved. So it's really all on Derek Carr now to come through and play like he did before his big injury and show that he's still the guy that they thought they had when they signed him to the big contract. Yeah, no, there's no question. I think, and and, and it's it's interesting to me. I, I tend to be on the the positive side of of the Derek Carr situation. Not all Raiders fans, especially, are there. Um, there's a lot of skepticism for whatever reason, uh, and and so it, that storyline will be interesting. He is such a positive guy um, that I don't anticipate seeing really too much frustration or anything out of him. He seems so well grounded, but it definitely will be a story, and as will the move to Las Vegas and all the transitioning going on there. Jesse Reed from sportsnot.com. Jesse, man, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you read him, and we'll have you on during the season for sure. Sounds great. Thanks a lot for having me on. It's been a pleasure. All right. That's Jesse Reed from sportsnot.com. We appreciate him being with us today. And, guys, if we look at that uh, and some of the things he highlighted there, to me, and, Chaz, you said, you know, a lot of the the on-the-field it, the battles on the field. The yeah. battles on the field. And it's funny, too, because yesterday HBO uh, talked about Hard Knocks and said that it was going to focus a lot more on football, they say. Yeah. So I think there's some credence to what you say. Then again, I think Jesse's points about some of these storylines, it's drama, right? They call it reality television, but let's face it. They're going to follow storylines. We don't know them. I think Josh Jacobs is going to be a big one right? Uh, because the kid is – his story is unbelievable. He's a great young man. We'll see how it all goes down. But – That's the end of the first hour here on Silver and Black today. When we come back, Leo Gray, Super Bowl champ with the Raiders, former UNLV player as well. He's going to be with us to talk about training camp, talk about some stories, and also about what the Raiders are doing here in the Las Vegas community. It's unbelievable. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Warm up with the weekend's top sports stories and headlines. Join the rotation. Sunday mornings at 10 on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black. The nation and the league arrive in Las Vegas in 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. And now, here's your host. Scott Gobranson. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And it always feels better, guys, when there's a Super Bowl ring in the studio. Yeah. And we have one today, as, uh, and it is on the finger, the left ring finger, correct? Yeah, of, ring finger. Correct. Of um, our good friend and just a great, great guy, former Raider, former UNLV Rebel, also... BC, Toronto, and Saskatchewan in Canada. Is that right? All three? I get all yes. three right? Okay. Got Leo right. Gray joins us now here on the Silver and Black today. Leo, how's your Sunday going, man? It's excellent. Thank Good. you, Scott. Happy to be here. And and again, I Leo, I, I don't know that he appreciates me talking about all the time, but your voice, man, you got that voice. I wish I had that voice. Oh, voice. oh you ought to stop. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, stop, yeah. man. Stop. Dress it up. Put makeup on it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we wanted to have Leo in because obviously we're going into training camp. Training camp rookies um, show up on Tuesday and then vets come in later in the week and then they go at it. They start in on practice. And so we wanted to bring Leo in as somebody who's been through that. 
uh, to talk a little bit about um, training camp and what it's like and what it what it feels not only as a player but as a team for these guys to get into camp after the quote unquote long off season, which seems a lot shorter than it used to be. But Leo, here we are a few days. Talk about those few days before camp starts because it to me it almost feels like I know when you start a new job right to to just for everybody else out there when you start a new job. You're excited, you're nervous, you're all those things mixed into one, and you just want to get there. Is that is that how it is leading up for those first few days before camp? Yes, yes, yeah. it's, it's a nervousness that um, it's a good it's a good feeling though, because you know you're going and you've prepared for it, um, you've trained, you've done everything you needed to do, and then the last couple of days you don't really want to kill yourself because you want to get there and you want to build up a little. You don't really know what's going to happen, but you want to be in the best shape of your life. So you go out there, you want to be optimistic, you know it's going to be a little bit different than what you dealt with in college. So it's it's an exciting feeling at the same time you're nervous. Oh yeah, no, I can I can see that. And and for me, you look at before we went on the air, we talked about training camp has changed significantly from for example, that first year you were with the Raiders. Um, not only because of the personalities and the rules, but with the last collective bargaining agreement and the amount of time cuz was it was it when you were there? Was it three practices a day, or no, two, we went, da, two a day? Um, we had we had meetings, and then we had a special team like walkthrough. But uh-huh. you, we had six weeks of two a days. <laughs> it was it was totally different. And yeah, you hit. Uh, I know now you had to cut back because of the like you said the collective bargaining agreement concussions. But uh, it's we we were hitting every day. I mean, you were sore. Next morning, you would get up. You barely could move. That signal that was supposed to be sent. From the mind to the body, it didn't always work. Right, you, know, you had to pick a pick a leg up and throw it to the side and roll out of bed. Wow. Now, so. when when you talk to some players uh, that played with you during that time in the eighties, uh, some of them sort of look back at camp and say, "Oh, if they only had to do camp like we had to." Do you think I mean, clearly with injuries, not only the head injuries, but just mm-hmm. in general with players and the shape that they stay in year round now? Um, do you think has anything been lost? For them, because the camp is shorter, um, I don't think so. We laugh about it because we we have alumni weekend next week, so we'll go out there. We sit in the stands and we laugh about <laughs> and heckle it. them. But at the same, <laughs> oh, we do. But at the same time, the speed of the game, uh, the size of these these guys is a lot different. Average lineman is what three thirty. Oh Back gosh. when I played, they were two eighty, two seventy. It was a lot different. So I mean, they're flying around so. If you didn't tone it down a little, you're going to have bodies everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it, it's it's crazy how the game has changed and in going into camp, um you have players clearly there's there's different different reasons or different people have different reasons there. There's guys that are going to be there like you were, right? Mm-hmm. Coming in trying to make a team. Right. Maybe weren't drafted free agent whatever it may be or they're trying to catch on mm-hmm. from somewhere else. So they clearly have one goal, that's to make the team. Then you have guys who are, don't have any problem making the team. They have guaranteed money. They have all this stuff. Um, how does that? How does the difference play in camp amongst the guys? You got a guy sur- trying to fight for survival, and you got a guy who's just trying to get in shape and not get hurt. Right? What What does that do me- from a mental standpoint for the entire team? Um, well, you have some veterans that will tell rookies and the guys that are trying to make that team. Like I remember, um, we 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 would do three hundred yard uh, sprints at the end of practice. And Lester Hayes would always get on me because I would fly. And in my <laughs> head, I had told myself, I'm coming in first on every one right. of them. And they would say, you got to slow it down and stay with the group. <laughs> right. But every time I looked up, part of that group was walking to the bus with a plane ticket going back home. Right. So, <laughs> you, you know, it, it's, it's certain things that you see and you want to be a team player. You want to, you know, be one of the guys but you know you're on a mission yeah. to try to make that team. You want to so, stand out. Yeah, you want to stand out and do everything you possibly can to be there. Right. Yeah, it's – it's. I mean, clearly, I think those – and, and we, we talked with Jesse Reed in the previous segment about the idea that, that well, Hard Knocks is going to be there. Can you imagine when you were in camp, Leo, having cameras following you everywhere? Can you imagine what that would be like? It would have been um, – with the guys that we had – <laughs> it would have been classic. I said earlier, it would have been epic. You yeah. Because we had some characters. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was some, um, yeah, it would have been good t- uh, television. Some of it would have to have been edited out 
<laughs> but it would have been it would have been exciting for everybody. So it would have been three minutes long, is what you're saying. Oh yeah, it would have been, yeah. <laughs> hard knocks. Yeah, it would have, it would have been a classic. Well, yeah. so so when we talk about camp in its current form, Leo, uh, as a player these days going in, we talked about guys there trying to make the team, guys trying to get in shape. Because the players are in in such shape, is is that camaraderie that chemistry? Because chemistry, I think, so many times you can have a great team that has all the talent in the world. But if the guys aren't gelled together well, they don't win. With with training camp, how much of that time spent together really goes towards building that chemistry? Um, a lot of it. I mean, uh, most of it. Because you come in, I mean, everybody, unlike, you, you have, what, three uh, different, different mini camps that you come together. Right. And you're working, and all of the guys are coming in fit. You know you have to come in fit because it's a lot different. Than yeah. before, sure. uh, even if you have a guaranteed contract, sometimes you know you could end up somewhere else. So uh, the camaraderie and everything, it's there, but you understand that it's a business. It's a business. Things happen that might not make sense to you, but they make sense to management. Mm-hmm. It, uh, it's for no one wants to go out and lose. I mean, owners and management and everyone else, they're trying to put a product on the field that will work together. So you might see a person that you thought, okay, our camaraderie was great and blah, 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 and that person <laughs> is gone all of a sudden. Right. But there were some other things that took place that, you know, was going to, when they look at it long term, you know, you have to make those adjustments. Did you have, um, who was your roommate? Malcolm Barnwell and Kenny Hill. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, I'll see Malcolm uh, next weekend. Well, I got to yeah. imagine, yeah, that yeah. when you go back, it, all those guys must have circled that date mm-hmm. on the calendar. Oh, yeah. Everybody getting back together. Oh, yeah. We have at least 90 guys that come come back. Wow. And, again, it's funny because we, we're clowning, we're laughing, we're yeah. joking, we're talking about them really bad. Yeah. If they heard, <laughs> if they mic'd us up, that would be classic, too. Maybe they yeah. will. Yeah. They, they should. Yeah. I mean, the, the Raider alumni group is just phenomenal of what you guys do with the team. Um, and, and, and that reminds me though, when, when you go up there now for alum, mm-hmm. for alumni, last year was the first year with coach Gruden back. This will be the second year. Uh, and now you have Mike Mayock and some of the other folks there with you. What have you noticed? And, and this is not a slight in any way on coach Del Rio. Cause he's a good man. We talked about that earlier, but what's the difference in the mood and the, the energy when you walked in the building last year versus the previous alumni session? Um, when we walked into the hotel or when you walk on the practice facility? The practice facility, the mood okay. around the team and all of that. The intensity level is a little bit different. Yeah. Um, you, could, you could feel the energy. I mean, John is a teacher. He teaches. He's in your face. He's moving around. There's a lot of movement, but he knows what he's talking about. Mm-hmm. So you know, hey, this is serious. You know, when, uh, the stuff we used to do is a little bit different now. You have some coaches that are kind of like a good friend to a lot of the players. Mm-hmm. And then you have the other coaches, hey, they demand a certain level of uh, respect. They demand a certain level of talent on that field, and they're going to hold you accountable to do what you signed that contract for. Mm-hmm. So, it's you know, you could feel it when you're on, on the field. You could feel You could see the guys moving around and, you know, doing things, and it was a little bit different. Yeah, there seems to be, <clears throat> pardon me, there seems to be a, a, the good cop, bad cop. The, the coach mm-hmm. that's up your backside and then the coach who takes you aside and says, hey, listen, let me help you. And, right. I mean, you need that, right? You need a, a, a good balance, right. correct? My best coach was the one, if he was hanging on a hill, I would have stepped on his pants and <laughs> <laughs> golf <laughs> shoes. Right. So he, but he made a player out of me. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Well, and going up to the, this alumni weekend, is there is there one thing that you're specifically – uh, excited to see or a player that you'd really want to to watch besides seeing the guys obviously that you played with um I like Derek Carr um I think Derek is a, a very good quarterback I do I think he's the quarterback of the future I think he'll be here when the team moves here uh, a very nice person um, he demands uh he's a leader you, and you could see it you yeah. could feel it he's one of the guys as well. Um, Antonio Brown, you know, because I've watched his uh, you sure. know, his training uh, videos. Um, I like his work ethic. Um, he's different. You know, when I came to uh, the Raiders back then, I was a wide receiver. So a lot of the things he does reminds me of Jerry Rice. I mean, it's not wow. the um, – I mean, he he's going to fight for the ball. 
Right. It's not you. I mean, if you put that ball out there, if he doesn't get it, nobody's going to get it. <laughs> and um, I mean, he puts his time in, his work in, and I mean, he's. I like him. I, he's like, I like the way he plays. He oh is, yeah, he's very he's exciting, incredible athlete. Yeah. And and you know, because he has that big persona, I think a lot of people like to bag on him because they, they think do. of him as boastful. But you know what? Uh, for some people, that's what they do. That's what they, and 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 I think he's going to have a, a huge mm-hmm. year. He's focused. When you yeah. see somebody focused like that, yeah. it's going to be fascinating. All right, we're going to step aside. When we come back, we're going to talk more with Leo Gray about training camp. He's going to give us some stories about his days. Oh. All all for Family Radio, though. So don't worry about that. Uh, we'll talk about his first camp, the conversation he had with Al Davis when he switched his position, and things like that. You're listening to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, eleven forty. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Welcome back to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. And we are joined in studio by Leo Gray, former Oakland Raider, UNLV Rebel. And uh, we're talking about training camp with him. Of course, myself, Scott Branson, Chaz Osborne, and Kelly Kreiner with you as well. All right, Leo, so we, we were talking about uh, uh, camp and, and your first time in camp and kind of what it is, the generalities of going to camp. Now we want to talk a little more specifically because people love the era in which you played, so late 70s into the 80s, that 1980 team that won the Super Bowl down in New Orleans, um, you know, uh, just one of those, those, those Raiders teams with so many storylines, so many people, so many personalities around it. <laughs> Pardon me, I'm, I'm choked up by it. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, I feel the same way. But but we wanted to start there too because when you went to training camp that first year with the Raiders, um, uh, a gentleman by the name of Al Davis called you to his office and he wanted to have a conversation. Tell tell folks about that conversation and what it was about. Okay, well, in uh, college, high school, Pop Warner, I was a diva. Oh, an original <laughs> diva, no. a wide receiver. And now you hate didn't want to get a speck on the, on, on the uniform. Uniform had to be clean. Everything had to be perfect. Towel in place, sweatbands, all of that good stuff. Yeah. So I'm out there at the first little mini camp, and I'm, I'm doing really well. I'm catching the ball. And uh, Dan, Dante Pastorini was there at the time. And he and I were clicking. He was throwing a long ball, and I had speed. So, you know, that's great. That's what they saw in me, the speed part of it. So I'm going deep, catching passes left and right. Feeling good about myself. And so we went through, uh, I think, a camp and a half. It might have been the second camp. I get a call. Uh, Mr. Davis wants to see you. Uh-oh. So Malcolm looks up. We, were, you know, we had finished one of the practices. We were in, our, um, in the hotel. And uh, Malcolm looks at me. Al wants to see you? I said, Mr. Davis wants to see me. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't let the negative thoughts go into my head at the time. I figured he just probably wanted to talk to me about something. So I go to the office, go in there to sit sit down and talk with him. He looks me in the eye. He says, you're doing well in camp. I like what you're doing. I love your speed. And we're going back and forth. And he said, have you ever played defense? Oh. So it's <laughs> like my, my chin fell to the ground. And I, I looked at him, and I was waiting for him to break a smile. He never did. Oh, boy. <laughs> he said, I think you could play defense. I said, Mr. Davis, I've never played defense at all. I've never ran down on a kickoff, never done anything like oh. that. All I've done is catch passes and score touchdowns. Right. That's what you know. That's what I do. So he said, <laughs> starting tomorrow, you're playing defensive back. He said Willie Brown's going to work with you. He was a receiver at Gramlin, and he said you got the perfect person. I think you could do it. Wow. So I went from having a white jersey in the locker to I walked in that next day. It was a black jersey hanging up with number 15 on it. So, a, well, and and Leo. So you get that call first of all, Mr. Davis. I mean, you know that everybody knows like that is. That's the guy. So he does everything, right? right. He's former coach. He's the owner. He's j- everything. So you go down there, um, and and what is the expectation when you walk? Was it was it that you might get let go? I mean, what was your thought process when you went down? Or were you confident that you were going to – it was just starting out, right? So it wasn't like you were deep into mm-hmm. your first camp and cuts yeah. were coming. Yeah. But what was the thought process for you when you got that, that I message? Was, I was confident because I had been doing really well. Right. I just figured he wanted to talk to me. And just try to fill me out a little bit. Because he was talking to me on the sideline on the field all the time. He'll pull Malcolm Barnwell and I were like his 
two pet speedsters. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, he was always – and I got another story for you uh, yeah. about that too with Malcolm and I. You know, well, yeah, I tell us. He, Go right ahead. Uh, yeah, but um, – you have a positive attitude going into it. So yeah, you're thinking, yeah, so you're good. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, when I went in, I just figured he, it was something he wanted to ask me or it might have been an adjustment. He wanted to make a wide receiver, right. moving somebody around. It just didn't enter my head about being cut or nothing like that. Right. Yeah, so I, I, I was excited to go in there and sit down with him one-on-one mm-hmm. because he's so engaging. And from the first day that I got there, he made me feel welcome. Right. So it wasn't like – Different things. We hear a lot of those stories head. about Al and yeah. the players. Yeah, he made me feel like I had a chance. I was going to be there. It wasn't like any minute something could happen. Right. That it didn't enter my head. But it, going back, Malcolm Barnwell and I, after uh, we would go through uh, the training camp or whatever, you'd stay out there, and um, they put you up in the Hilton or the Hyatt. I forgot what hotel it was, but they put us up in the El hotel. Dorado. <laughs> it wasn't that. It might have been back in the day. Yeah. Not right now. But they put us up in the hotel, and, you know, we would go and practice every day. And um, um, it would be like individual practices. you go out there pretty much on your own. You'd lift and go outside and do different things. And so we get a call one day. We're, it was our day off. And we're lying on the bed looking at soap operas like we always did at that time, <laughs> Malcolm and I. So they said, if somebody at the front desk wants you to come down, get your workout gear, come downstairs. So we looked at each other like, what? We're off today. Yeah. So we get our stuff. We go downstairs. It's Al Davis. Wow. Al said, get in the car. We get in his black Fleetwood Cadillac. Yeah. And he drove us to the practice facility, told us to get dressed. We walked in and we got dressed. Now, Malcolm and I, were silent, and all we did was run our mouth. We, you couldn't shut us up. <laughs> so both of us are looking at each other. Mr. Davis has us over here at the practice facility. Yeah. So we put our stuff on, walked outside. Al came outside, start, had me go play defensive back, had Malcolm run routes. He would tell Malcolm a route and have me guard him. And then he was coaching us all the way through, throwing wow. the ball as a quarterback while Malcolm would run the route, and I'd try to break the pass up. Right. And we were out there for about an hour. Then after we got finished, he drove us back, dropped us off. You guys have a good day. How did it feel for you, though? Were you in the mindset of, like, maybe I can do this? We were in shock. We didn't know what was going on. But for you playing defense all of a sudden, did you think, you know, maybe um, this is something I can do? Well, I had, to do it? I had confidence because of the confidence that he had given me. Right. Him looking me in the eye, being the genius that he was, telling me that I could do it. Right. I had faith I could. Yeah. Yeah. And then I had in my head that playing receiver – I could put myself in the mindset of a, what, what a receiver right. would do at that particular time. Right. You're one so step I'm ahead. trying to, yeah, I'm one step ahead of what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And running the routes, you know, I kind of knew the routes. So right. certain things I could break on and, and do certain things because I've been there, done that. Yeah. yeah. It was such an incredible season. Um, oh yeah, I know. I know. Going into that season, the Raiders weren't even picked to, to be first. Uh, they were picked to be last, and that was Seattle was in the division back then. There were so many question marks. They had just traded, mm-hmm. you know, the Snake for Pastorini, right? And then uh, they Dave drafted Casper. Mark Wilson. Mm-hmm. So there's all these question marks going into the season, and then Pastorini goes down at the fourth or fifth game of the season, mm-hmm. and then here comes Plunkett, takes you guys all the way to the promised land. Right. Just just one of those amazing seasons where nothing was supposed to go right, and everything just. Sure did. Turn road. I think we were only favored to probably win four games yeah. that year. And all through the playoffs, the whole shot, we were favored to lose. The Super Bowl, we were Every favored game. to lose. Yeah. So some people made a lot of money in Vegas <laughs> off of uh, that That was team. weird because there was yeah. two wild cards back then, and the, only the one seed got the, the bye. Mm-hmm. I think Cleveland was the mm-hmm. one seed, right? So you yeah. guys went into Cleveland. Wild card. Yeah, we wild were the first card. team to win. First, first wild card yeah, team wild ever card win team the Super Bowl. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, what a just what, such an amazing season because I remember, right. you know, everybody talking about they're not even favored to oh, yeah. win anything. Yeah, they were picked last. Yeah, we division. heard the stories. We <laughs> walk in, and but it motivated us, right? You know, and Al was constantly hammering home. You know, we could do this. Right, we got this. And that's unfortunate because you had that with Pastorini. You guys had that connection, yeah. Clicking, and then all of a sudden, yeah. here he comes telling you, "Man, you want to play defense?" Mm-hmm. You're thinking, "I got a connection with the starting quarterback." Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He also uh, took me to the bank one day and. uh we were standing in line together, and he showed me a check that was equivalent to the one I got for the whole year right. for one week. <laughs> for one yeah. week, yeah, he also did that to yeah. me. Yeah. I heard some stories with Pastorini yeah, he, driving his uh, Porsche, yeah, right? he's, uh, 100 yeah. miles an hour through the oh, parking yeah. lot. Yeah, he, uh, yeah, he turned out to be a race car. He likes speed. He likes yeah, he likes speed. Speed boats, cars. Right. Yeah. Well, and we we have some other stories we want to get to. Can you stay for one more? Yeah. All yes. right, great. Because we're talking to Leo Gray, former Raider. 
Uh, and you have some stories. I want to tell. I want you to tell the story you told me a few days ago about when you got moved to defensive back, and one of those first plays you came out, you had to deal with a pulling art shell, <laughs> oh. which is like to me just a nightmare. It's like a truck coming at you. So we'll talk about that in in a few. But when when we when you talk about Al Davis, right? So a lot of the younger fans, Leo, don't remember a time where Al was at his full strength, where he was at full health. Uh, and I think that for many of them, he is a, 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 a legendary figure. But the way he changed the game, I don't know. I don't know that a lot of younger fans understand how much he had to do with that. Yeah, definitely a pioneer. Yeah. I mean, he had the first African-American head coach and uh, I think the first uh, Latino head coach yes. for quarterbacks. Yes. Um, he was first to bring them in. I mean, the first uh, female uh, top executive in the front office. Amy Trask. Yeah. So he's always, you know, he's been on the cutting edge, and, you know, you can't tell him no. <laughs> yeah, you can't tell him no. He's, he's, yeah. it's, it's interesting. Um, well, we're going to step aside for a break here. When we come back, we'll spend more time with Leo Gray. We'll hear that Art Shell story, and we'll talk to him about his amazing work with the Raiders in the Las Vegas community. You're listening to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. CBS Sports Radio. How you doing? This is Charlie Garner, and you're listening to Silver and Black Today. Stay tuned. Oh, yeah. Charlie Garner bringing us back in. I think Josh Jacobs is going to be a lot like Charlie Garner, actually. Used the same way. But we'll talk about that another time. We are joined in the studio today. It's always nice, again, to have a Super Bowl ring yeah. in the house. Hey, put that ring up there, uh, Leo, for the camera so they can see it. Right up right up towards there. There it is. It's, it's on eBay. Um, <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm joking. How about oh compared my. to the rings they have nowadays? Oh, that's a brass knuckle think, now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh. That, those rings, yeah. like, it, I don't think nowadays, you can really wear them. You have, yeah. to, you have to just like... Uh, Hope that uh, that it's just a pendant or something. I got a couple in my day, and yeah. I don't even wear them. They're just so big and gaudy and ridiculous. Like, when we oh. had the groundbreaking uh, here in uh, November, and uh, was it 2017? Yeah, yeah. Robert Kraft was here, ah. and he had one of them on, and I looked at, it and he was let he let people try it on. It was huge, right? Yeah, it was a nice. Yeah. Especially because I mean, with all due respect to Mr. Kraft, he's not exactly the largest man in the world either. That's so it, I can yeah. imagine, <laughs> yeah. You know, this was huge. You see, like yeah. Art Shell, which we're going to talk about in a second. <laughs> Art Shell wears a ring like that. You know, he's a big guy. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. not Robert Kraft. Okay, so Leo, you get you you get told by Al Davis that you're going to switch to defensive back after being a wide receiver. So your ego takes that away a little bit. Your bruised ego yes. from being a wide receiver, yeah. which you got to have that ego to be a wide receiver. Um, and you're now ready to go out right and 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 face that that first practice. Um, as a defensive back, wearing the black jersey, you said, was it? Black jersey. Black yep. jersey, not the white jersey. Yeah. And then the first play, right? It's the first play or one of the first plays? Mm-hmm. Tell people what one happened. Of, this is a remarkable story. One of the first drills. Well, it was a drill where the defense lines up, and you put the cornerback, which I was playing. He's out wide at his position. It's a receiver out there. You have the lineman pulling down the line, and running back gets the ball, and you're supposed to turn the play back inside. It's like a sweep. Mm-hmm. Running back is running the sweep. You turn it inside. The lineman is pulling down the line. You're supposed to come up, take the lineman on, oh. and turn the play inside. <laughs> that lineman happened to be Hall of Famer, <laughs> um, Art Shell. And so Art was 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, 280, which was huge <laughs> at, that, at time. that time. Oh, my gosh. Now yeah. they're 330, but Art was huge at that time. So Willie, the defense back coach, he tells me, you know, come up break down, turn the play back inside, get up underneath him, and he showed me a move that you're supposed to take your forearm and, like, get into the person with because you're getting low. Get into him and knock him off you, turn the play inside. So I've always been coachable. I did everything I was coached to do. But when Art came down that line and he hit me, I went flying about (laughs) 10 to 15 yards. Oh, my my gosh. My helmet came off. The helmets at that time had little snap-in earpieces. The earpieces came out of the helmet. (laughs) My mouthpiece came out. They say you see stars. I saw birds and planes. (laughs) I saw space shuttles. I saw some of everything. But, uh, yeah, he he won that one. Uh, So afterwards, they picked me. Lester runs over. He picks me off the ground. He called me my rookie. Yeah, My rookie. 
do, you got to do the old lay. You got to give him a jab step and, and shuttle him by. I said, Willie didn't tell me that. Nobody <laughs> told me that. So they laughed it off. It was real funny. Oh, my god, It gosh. was hilarious. I, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about the um, Leo Gray speed training, mm. right? Um, yeah. Now, I know you didn't play your senior, your senior season, but your persistence and your determination to make it to the NFL mm-hmm. just shows. Uh, my favorite thing that you do is um, your, your uh, mindset coaching. Mm-hmm. Now, this is all part of the speed training. You're getting people's bodies into rhythm. Yeah. And I know you're working with, you know, high school kids, college kids. Tell us yeah. a little bit about the Leo yeah. Gray speed training. Well, I did, you know, I did play. I lettered every year at, at UNLV. I, I was a letterman. Okay. I didn't start. Okay. For him, but you know, I was alternating going in and out and that kind of stuff. But never scored, caught two passes. But my speed training, um, I was fortunate enough to work with a lot. Of, I ran track for UNLV, and uh, uh, Coach McDaniel's. I think he's in the Hall of Fame, a legend. Yes. Yep. He was very good at uh, our whole relay team was football players, so uh, we were pretty quick. And most of them were from LA. No, we two from LA, Nebraska. Forgot uh, Johnny where Sacramento. So. Um, Running track was always something that I loved. I knew it would complement what I did on the field. Right. Um, once I would come back in the off season, I would train out at UCLA. It was a coach out there named Hully that worked with us, and I trained with Flo Jo, Greg Foster, a lot of Olympians, wow. and uh, we had some workouts that were legendary. And uh, I learned to put different things together from like four to five different coaches. You developed a and formula. And I developed a formula for speed, for running. And that allowed me, you know, to get to the next level. It allowed me to become a better teacher. I had a background in martial arts. Uh, Dominic Giacobbe trained me since I was 12, a young kid. Wow. And uh, he always taught the mindset part of life, you know, how you attract those things to you that you think about. So, you know, a negative person could never go around him. I mean, his energy was so good. Right. And uh, that allowed me to be able to go out here and share things with the kids that I coach, and they pick it up really fast and been able to, you know, change lives, get them out there, and they're having a good time. Yep. I have a good time coaching them, and so it's a lot of fun, yeah. you know, to see a kid light up because you took something where they thought it was difficult to run. They were told they were the slowest on the team, right. and they ended up being one of the fastest. So it's, it's exciting. Yeah, and the work in the community. Yeah, I was going to mention, Leo, you are a Raiders ambassador here in Las Vegas, uh, and we see you, because we cover all those events, David Stepani and our engineers at a lot of them, Chaz has been at them, I've been at them, and you're there, you're doing so much work with the Raiders and the community. Talk about that, I think folks in Vegas, I say this all the time, they don't quite understand what what it means to have an NFL team in your community and how much the organization does. The mm-hmm. Raiders have a great history of giving back to the community in Oakland, Los Angeles. And and a year and a half before they, well, actually two years before they moved to Las Vegas, they started doing it. What are you doing with them? And just talk about that scope. Mm-hmm. Mark Davis, Mark Bedane have done an excellent job as far as uh, giving back to various communities. I mean, they're doing, at the same time, we're doing a lot of stuff out here. Great work. The Community Foundation is on it. I mean, they're like, to me, they're like a United Way, an umbrella organization that allocates money out to a number of different health, education, and welfare programs. Yep. But they're doing it at the same time in the Bay Area, up in Alameda, in Oakland. Right. So it's, it's legendary. I, I like using that word. You know, you talk <laughs> about what, what the Raiders are doing to, to build the brand here. I mean, we all know it's all about building the brand, Mm -hmm. but at the same time with the Raiders, it's about building communities. Mm -hmm. So it's not just that we want to get your dollars. It's we know this is a social ill that needs to be addressed. I was fortunate enough to sit on a panel and uh, we donated, I forgot, uh, it might have been 25,000 to Safeness. Yes. It's a nonprofit program that addresses the social ill domestic violence. And uh, we hear about that a lot, of, a lot about that in the NFL. It's a lot happening. But yeah. the Raiders are in the forefront of addressing, you know, that social ill. So that, that was important. We sat and uh, we talked about the different things. And, I, you know, having dealt with it as a kid, domestic violence, you know, I'm familiar with it. But uh, to hear these stories and see the things that are going on and, uh, you know, how it plays a role polit- politically, uh, it just was one of those things where you said, okay, th- it's, this is something. You know, being able to be a part of going out, representing the Raiders who are going out here addressing the needs of a certain community. And it was the same thing with the the veterans of America, the U.S. vets. 
you know, I didn't know there were that many vets that were homeless. And, yeah, Arnold you know, Stock over at Veterans Village. Yeah, which you, yeah. Veterans, Veterans Village. I mean, there's some programs out there doing great things. And we, the, I mean, every dollar helps. Uh, they're not getting as much money as they should. For, you know, Vegas to be as wealthy as it is with so much money changing hands, it's a lot of uh, support groups out there that are changing lives. And, you know, some of it is going unnoticed. So, yeah. you know, I, I would hope, you know, that uh, the listeners out there, would try to do whatever they could, you know, to help some of these different support groups out yeah. there because they're, they're changing lives. Yeah, and I mean, for you, a lot of people in Las Vegas, for those folks that weren't in favor of the funding of the stadium, now you're a Las Vegas resident. Mm-hmm. You were before the Raiders moved, decided mm-hmm. to move. So you're a part of this community. You have been for a long time. Um, but I, that's what I always tell them. If they're not a football fan, I tell them these are other things that are happening that this that – this, football team does in their community because it does trickle down they've done so much and i know you've been out a lot to schools mm-hmm. a lot of kid related stuff in, in addition to safe nest and veterans village mm-hmm. and many other things and uh, chris mallory over at the foundation does yes. a great 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 work but how fulfilling is that for you with your attitude towards life to go out and be able to do that in the community oh it's a great feeling i mean because you know i was raised you know knowing that you had to give something back and you know i grew up in south central los angeles at a time when that whole gang violence thing jumped off. And, you know, there were so many programs that were started up that were supposed to address that deadly issue. And uh, I got a sense of it then. And then, you know, you go to different places and you see, okay, in certain segments of that community, you have the same little problems. And so you need those different organizations that are addressing those ills, those social ills. Absolutely. And, um, no, yeah. it's, it's great stuff. And, and Leo Gray, we appreciate you coming in. As always, and we'll have you on during the season. We, we talked about this. I'm going to try to convince you to come in as much as you can uh, and <laughs> talk some better. football, too. We'll, we'll see how yeah. the Raiders are doing this year. So we thank you for joining us. And um, people, follow Leo on Twitter, mm-hmm. Leo Gray 15 yeah. right? You and, got it? On, on Instagram, Leo underscore Gray. Leo underscore Gray. G-R-A-Y. On and see yeah. the amazing work he's doing with kids and adults here yeah. in town. Leo Gray. Right. Oakland Raiders alumni. Thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for having me. All right. We're going to step aside. We'll come back. We'll close out the show with Kelly's Corner. You've been listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. You found the most in-depth coverage of the Silver and Black. This is Silver and Black Today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gobranson. Thanks for joining us again as we are here every Sunday. And a special thank you to Leo Gray for coming in the studio. Three, I mean, just three great uh, interview segments there with him about training camp, about his training camp, and then, of course, what he's doing in the community here. Just fantastic stuff. Thank you to Leo Gray for coming in. We'll have him a lot uh, during the season to talk about football as well. Just a great guy. Exudes positivity when you're around him. Speaking of exuding positivity. <laughs> That's a professional segue right there, folks. <laughs> it's time for Kelly's Corner. Where is Kelly taking us today? Here he comes. Now, I've been one of the few people that has defended Roger Goodell the last few years on some of the stuff that he's done. Because what people need to realize, he he works for the owners. He's there to take the bullets for the owners. That's what he. That's what his job is to do. But I just – the Tyreek Hill thing right now is just blowing my mind about how every every time there's a discipline issue that comes up, there's absolutely no rhyme or reason how they're coming up with these suspensions, why they're doing them. I mean how they can say that there was no evidence that – or for the off-field behavior. Jimmy Smith got suspended four games in 2008 for supposedly threatening and, you know – we. We never really heard quite all the evidence and everything that came out in that. So, I mean, it was one of those things they just said they found evidence. Mm -hmm. We all heard the call to where he flat out says, you should be terrified of me too, and throws out the B word. Mm -hmm. But what gets me with that is he's talking about, the girlfriend's talking about our son is terrified of you. And he's saying you should also, which means he thinks the kids should be terrified of him also. And, oh, let's not forget, this is the same girl that he pled guilty to punching and strangling when she was eight months pregnant. Mm -hmm. And yet they're saying there's no evidence for suspension. They are just suspending people left and right for stuff all the time. 
And this one, this is the one they choose. Like, nah, we're gonna let this one slide. It's toothless. It's gutless. And it's a bad. It's just a black eye for the end. They say it's right it's, a, it's ongoing, or is that that's the final? E- no, that's even worse because they said it's they said that the, it's closed right now. But if something else comes up, well, it's you're taking the coward's way out. Right. It's you know you're doing a half measure on something, and just you're pushing this off. It's such a carbon copy world we live in. You'd think they would give the same. You know, if, if uh, other guys are getting four game suspensions for the same thing. Why all of a yeah, sudden? And, and that's that's the issue everybody has with these NFL suspensions and NFL fines and everything is there's there's just no there's no consistency in them. Well, and, and, and I, I agree. I think consistency in in punishments and suspensions have been an issue for the NFL for quite a while, not just on this issue, but on other things, too. It seems like there's folks who get much harsher punishments than others for similar discre- indiscretions. Now, I will say this. There, there is – there's two differences here. One is, is there enough to suspend them under NFL conduct policy? And then is there enough evidence to prosecute a person in the criminal justice system? Those are two separate issues. I see people confusing those. When I look at Tyreek Hill, did they have enough evidence, as you said, to take him? And they didn't because they said they didn't. doesn't mean they're not still trying to find some, by the way, but they didn't. But when it comes to NFL rules – there are guys who do far less things or accused of, not even have been convicted or proven to do, less than Tyreek Hill, but yet they are punished and Tyreek Hill, Kelly, gets away with it. And that's the point. That's the one point I was going to make is the accusation has been enough to get people suspended in the past. We have an audio recording of him threatening her and, oh, no, we have no evidence. It just, I mean. It, why do you think? Why do you think they're being soft on him? I hate to say it, but it's because he's the main weapon for their new golden boy. You think Pat, so? Pat Mahomes is on the face of Madden. He's everybody. Mm. He is the thing the NFL is trying to – they're gravitating toward too. And because all these ads, all these things you see are Pat Mahomes, Pat Mahomes. Everybody talks about Pat Mahomes. It's, you know, you're taking away the best weapon for your new poster child, and that's – they're not going to do it. You buy that theory, Chaz? I do. I do, unfortunately. I thought it would just be a two-game suspension, maybe something half. And that's the thing. Two games in the grand scheme of Is nothing, this, but still, it's something. It's something. Right. It shows you're trying to do something, but you just flat out do nothing. It just it makes my blood boil. Well, and, and throw in, let's throw in a Raiders storyline here, right, which is the Richie Incognito thing, which is odd and weird in the same way, but he gets a two-game suspension for that. Right. Now, he was arrested, right, for all the things we talked about, trying to get his dad's head and the guns in his car and all that stuff. So he gets that. But then Tyreek Hill, who is charged with at first, later drop, but still there is enough, enough circumstantial evidence for the NFL to have given him at least a two-game suspension. Let's face it, like you said. The fact that the NFL is doing nothing, I mean, it's hard. Like, I'm not a conspiracy theory guy, but your theory about – him being part of the Mahomes machine now in Kansas City and what that means to the league, it's hard to deny that it looks that way. It's just, I mean, I don't understand how anybody could argue, again, not guilt or innocence in a court of law, but I'm talking about conduct unbecoming of an NFL player. And, and the, the, just the fact that they say there was no evidence. Right. We have an 11-minute audio recording. He threatens her. I mean, we have this recording. And that's what I'm saying. Like I said, is that that's not enough to convict him in a court of law? But the yeah. NFL doesn't care about the court of law. This, I mean, at minimum, should have been a two game suspension. Right. And the Chiefs were expecting him to get suspended because you don't take Michael Hardman in the draft. You don't trade up to get this guy when you have almost no draft capital and the worst defense in football to draft a wide receiver if you think he's going to be there the whole time. No right. doubt. Well. That is, we'll see how it all develops. Maybe it's not over yet. It probably is, but well, we'll see. But, but Kelly, ma- I think but that makes it even worse in my I know. opinion. No, I agree. I agree. I agree. Slap in the face. And always uh, thought provoking with Kelly's corner. So we thank you for bringing that up. And I know that issue is not going to subside anytime soon. I don't think. I mean, it might for the NFL, but I think with fans and people who want to see the right thing done, it, it, it probably won't. So. But that's going to close out the show for Kelly Kreiner. Yeah. Guys, thanks. Uh, I, I think another great show. I think we've, you know, this this off season, so to speak, 
you know, I've, I tuned into a radio show this week where they said, oh, there's nothing going on. Well, if there's nothing going on, why am I going to listen to you? Right. There's lots going on. We've created some news here by bringing on some interesting guests. We want to thank today, of course, Ryan Wilson from CBSSports.com, talking about how Gruden can fix the Raiders. Benjamin Albright, live from Denver's training camp. Jesse Reed from Sports Not, And, of course, Leo Gray. So, Kelly, have a good week, man. I will. Yeah. And Chaz, you're going to be up in Napa this week, uh, with, and we'll have some live video and reports from training camp. Have Excited fun up about there. training camp, man. It's going to be. Man, I mean, must, must be nice not to have a job. Just be able to go <laughs> places wherever you want to. It's my job. Can you believe silver and black today? Sending me up to Napa, the international man of leisure. Give me a credit card and everything. It's uh, going to be we great. Will, we will also be up <laughs> there it's, as a it's, show. It's a prepaid card. We, <laughs> we'll also be up there as a show on August seventh or eighth for the Rams workouts. Make sure you visit. Uh, silverandblacktoday.com for Kelly Kreiner, for Chaz Osborne, I am Scott Branson. We will talk to everybody later. Thanks for joining us.